Greetings, Zero Squad, and welcome to this little lecture on an empire of madmen. We're going to see the ancient Roman Empire and the madmen that made it an empire. So, first we uh, already covered a little bit in class about Octavian as Caesar Augustus comes to the throne, so to speak, calling himself the first citizen, yes, but bringing in a new era of Rome. All right, and so since we've already covered that information and some of the glorious architecture of, uh, of Rome, under Augustus as well. I mean, the man is leaving a legacy in marble. The man is leaving a legacy in stone across the Roman Empire in ways that are honestly unforgettable. Some of the things like the aqueducts or the Pantheon or the Roman baths, things built by Marcus Agrippa, all glorious things. But he's also helping to build the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire, as we see under Augustus from the little colors here, is going to expand significantly, um, and then it's also going to lose some territories between the Rhine and the Elbe, all right, or the Elba, all right, and so Augustus uh, is going to take a dangerous little gamble on an area called Germania, leading us to the ambush that changed history, all right, so there are some historians that say that this little ambush in Teutoburg Forest is going to change the course of Western civilization. So the back Background here, uh, a little bit which we've already covered in class. All right, so Germania is seen as this uh, this area that is full of our of barbarian tribesmen, a bunch of men that uh, are expected to to you know sub, uh, be subdued by the civilization of Rome. And so now the the uh, Romans believe that they are far superior technologically speaking, uh, in terms of civilized culture, in terms of philosophy and government, they are far more civilized than those of Germania. However, what they're not accounting for is the fighting tenacity of those tribal warriors, all right? So Varus is going to be sent along with 15,000 men uh, to go subdue this area as a new province of Rome. Now, the 25-year-old prince of the Cherushi Arminius is going to try and stop them. All right, so his uh, tribal name has been lost to history. He spoke Latin, and he was familiar with Roman tactics. He was the kind of man that the Romans relied on to help their armies penetrate the lands of the barbarians before. He served side by side with them before. For his valor in the field of battle, he had been awarded the rank of a knight and the honor of Roman citizenship even. All right, so this is a guy that that uh, you know knows the Roman ways, and, and they're depending on him to help subdue this territory as a province. The thing is, though, that Arminius is going to suddenly switch sides. He'll become a traitor uh, in, in order to f try and liberate his own people from lo Roman influence. Now, his motives are, are kind of obscure, but most historians believe that he harbored uh, dreams of becoming a king of his own tribe and is going to use a brilliant deception in order to do it. He's going to convince the Romans that there's an uprising in northern Germania and try to draw those legions deep into that territory. So we're going to see some little, uh, some descriptions of that here. So here, the red blocks are representing the Roman legions. Now, the green blocks are representing different tribes uh, of the Germanic area. And so, uh, Arminius is going to convince the Romans that what they should do is camp out with some of their men amongst these tribesmen. Take 5,000 of their men and camp them out amongst the tribesmen so that they can, you know, get to know the tribesmen a little bit, get to know the culture. And initially, uh, uh, Varus thinks it's a great idea, so he will have his legions camp around this area, send 5,000 men to do it. Now, on an appointed day, the uh, the tribesmen are going to all slaughter those Romans that were camped out amongst them. So they will kill 5,000 of those Romans uh, right away, and, and Varus doesn't even know about it. He doesn't find out about it. Meanwhile, they're going to send a messenger to Varus and tell him there is an uprising up in the northern part of Germania that you should go and help us to defeat. And so he's going to say, well, hey, I'm an honorable guy. I will help you defeat them. The problem is he's lost some men. He's lost 5,000 men. They've been recalled, but they're not showing up because they're dead. And so as he goes up into the north, he's got a manpower disadvantage. And as he's passing into what will become, or what is known as the Teutoburg Forest, he's got some options here. All right, he's passing on the road, and in front of him, in the middle there, is a swampy little marshland area that uh, is going across the road. Basically, the road is all muddy and kind of flooded over. Not a good spot to take 
all of your 15,000 men. There's also two hills on either side and forest on either side of you. And so his options are he could go completely around it and go through the forest itself, traversing some difficult terrain, going through trees. It would be slow and arduous. Option two would be go to go straight through the swampy marshland uh, that is covering the road, and it'll be slow, it'll be arduous, and it won't exactly be very pleasant. All right, other option is divide your forces and kind of spread them around so they can move a little bit more quickly through the forested terrain and the hilly terrain and avoid the marsh entirely. Or, last option, you can just hang out. You can just sit there and wait and see what happens, wait for the marsh to dry up a little bit, better weather conditions, you name it. But he's an honorable guy. He decides it's time to move forward. He takes the option of going straight through the marsh. Not a great idea because on either side of him are the uh, groups of the barbarians that are going to come flooding down from the hillside and crush him right in the middle. Never a good idea to put yourself in that kind of situation, Varus. So what he'll do is defend with whatever men he can against the barbarian hordes and then withdraw his men into a, a, a little encampment, a fortified encampment. And once he gets there, he's hoping that he can, def can fend off these barbarians, which they will successfully do for a while, but at heavy cost of life. All right, and so after that, he's going to go out into the open, and then he's going to wait out in the open, this open field in the uh, outside the Tudorberg Forest, to build up another fortified encampment, hoping that the barbarians will come and face them in open ground like they're supposed to. All right, Romans are gentlemen. They're very similar to the British army facing off with the Americans. I mean, uh, in the American Revolution, they expect to fight a gentlemanly war against people that fight according to the so-called rules of war. Well, barbarians, you know, illiterate, hairy heathens that they are, they don't believe in fighting by the rules of war, so good luck with that one, buddy. Uh, the uh, Romans believed that this was insidious, all right? So the word insidious is very similar to the word um, that the Romans use for treason, uh, also very similar to the word that they use for ambush, all right? Ambush, insidious, treason, all the same thing. Plotting, conspiring, lying in wait, conspiracy, these are all akin to to the same thing for the Romans. They see Arminius's move here as something that is treasonous against the acceptable rules of how things are done. All right, and so then uh, Arminius and the boys never show up, and so he goes back to the Teutoburg Forest, and as he's marching through, he's faced with another terrible situation. He's got a hill to his right. Uh, straight ahead of him, he's got a lot of forest. To his left, he's got forest, and then a swamp another swamp, all right? And so his option is that he can circle around the swamp between the swamp and the trees, which you see in the upper right-hand corner. So that's the plan, is to do that. Well, guess what? The Germans show up in droves, and as they show up, they try to fend off as much as possible, fighting in the Roman style, but they're trapped, so to speak. So Varus has his men withdraw to another fortified encampment, and while they are building that and getting ready to defend from there, you, there's more German hordes that fly down the hillside to attack them. In the midst of that, the cavalry fighting for the Romans decides, well, I've had enough, and they try to take off, only to get destroyed by the Germans that are lying in wait in the trees for them. All right, so it doesn't go well. In the end of this thing, uh, this lovely little debacle, Varus is going to kill himself. He's going to fall on his sword as any good Roman would when he's faced with utter and total defeat. One of the officers fighting in the midst of the battle will finally surrender, and they will lose the legions, leaving Augustus back at home being beaten by barbarians, losing, it was something like a tenth of the Roman army, the Roman standing army, lost a tenth of them right there in one battle over the course of just five days. And so he screamed out, Quintus, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. Oh, beautiful moment. Well, didn't go so well. And so what this will do, another one of Augustus's legacies here, is that the Roman frontier along the Rhine is certainly confirmed. At that point, the Romans aren't going to be trying too often, again, to proceed out of the Rhine, not, Rhine, not for a long time anyway. And uh, they will start to build a fortified barrier up there, uh, trying to resist the Germanic hordes that are wanting to invade. And so many historians have looked at this as a what might have been type of thing. Because, uh, I mean, if 
Germany had been conquered by the Romans, they would have not been speaking a Germanic tongue. They would not have had Germanic culture. They would have been civilized, so to speak, by the Roman influence, been speaking a Latin tongue, had a Latin culture, would have uh, been very much more akin to like the French, for instance. And so the, uh, I mean, you think about it, if we had had a conquered Germany, we may not have had the Anglo-Saxon invasion of England with the Norman conquest. We may not have even had that. We may not have had uh, things like, I mean, there are historians that say we may not have had the world wars because Germany and France would not have had their cultural and military rivalries that happened in the 20th century. Now that might be a bit of a slippery slope, but dang it, it's fun to take a look at how one ambush could change the course of history. Meanwhile, Augustus, as we've discussed earlier in our, in our lectures, Augustus is the kind of guy that made it look like he was just the first citizen, that he was leading the people, and that he was just one amongst many of the people, trying to live the life of a good Republican here, right? Well, Suetonius tells us that on his deathbed, it, was less than, it wasn't so much of that uh, story. He says, when the friends he had summoned were present, he inquired of them whether they, they thought he had played his role well in the comedy of life. When they agreed, he quoted, almost as his last words, two lines from a popular drama, since the play has been so good, clap your hands, and all of you dismiss us with applause. Oh, he was just acting. He was just playing a role. As Susan Wise Bauer tells us, in the last moments of life, he could finally admit the truth that no one in Rome had dared to speak. His role as protector of the Republic had been placating, and his refusal to accept the title of emperor had been nothing but pretense, all done for the sake of the audience. Oh, beautiful. So the burning question as we take a look at uh, the Roman Empire and uh, some of the things after Augustus is, is it better to have a republic with checks and balances or an emperor with ultimate authority? An emperor who gets things done, right? But there are consequences for having one of those emperors. Sometimes, frankly, they are madmen. All right, so let's take a look at some of these emperors that we get uh, from the Julio-Claudian dynasty. All right, so there's three unifying elements after Caesar Augustus. First of all, we have the title of emperor. We have the office of emperor. We have civil servants and city councils that are serving at the lower level for the emperor and running his, helping to run his bureaucracy, bureaucracy for him on the local level. And then we have the army and the Praetorian Guard, which are there to lay down the law and keep things running. All right, uh, make sure that people are falling in line and keeping the barbarian hordes in check. Then we have the uh, is issue of succession. So under the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which uh, Augustus is going to found here, or help found, is that we, we're first of all going to get a new emperor, Tiberius, who's going to take over through a process of adoption. All right, and this is laying the foundations for the Julio-Claudian dynasty. All right, now uh, Tiberius, by the way, was no one's first choice. He was cold and distant. He was generally silent. He walked stiffly and he made these really weird hand gestures when he talked, all right? So he would, like, twiddle his fingers back and er, all around his face when he was talking. It was kind of weird, all right? So Tiberius initially, at least for Augustus, was seen as a bit of a placeholder. Um, he was the only one there. He was, like, the best one available at the moment, but not the ideal one. See, the emperor hoped to replace him with one of Julia's sons when they became older, but Julia was... Eh, an adulterous woman, all right? So uh, she was uh, often very drunk and debauched, and she was so much drunk and, and debauched that Augustus had her confined to Panditeria, or P Panditeria, excuse me, which is a prison island, all right? And so, yeah, I mean, he's kind of a harsh father. Um, and so he's, you know, trying to find someone who's good, and Tiberius just happens to be the one that's available at the, at the moment. Now, there are benefits to empire, uh, ones that we would discuss if you were in class with me today, but for now, we'll just have to take a look at now the way that things are going to be affected by some of these fun, rotten Roman emperors. We'll start with Tiberius. All right, so this guy is going to rule from 14 to 37 CE, uh, common era, and his favorite saying was, I don't care if they hate me so long as they obey me. His nastiest habit was breaking the legs of anyone who disobeyed. All right, so he had a good time uh, with criminals, certainly. That was kind of a standard procedure to crucify people and then break their legs. Uh, he would just do it if, they, if he didn't like them or if they disobeyed with him politically, socially, you name it. He would just break their legs. It was fun. All right, his rottenest acts uh, were the, his escapades on the island of Capri. So Capri 
was this fun little island that he used to hang out with or hang out on. And so one day he was in his home and at Capri there was a fisherman who caught an enormous mullet. And this fisherman wanted to present it to as a gift to the emperor. So what he did was he caught this fish and then he drags it, this massive beast, up a rocky ascent to the emperor's villa. And then when he gets to the villa, he tells the guard that he wants to see the emperor. And the guard is like, uh, I don't think you know what you're talking about here, buddy. You do not want to see the emperor right now. You're not allowed to, and plus it's not a good idea for you. And the guy, I mean, the fisherman's just, is, I mean, absolutely enthusiastic about this, and he just keeps arguing and debating with him. So finally, the guard says, all right, but you will regret it. So he lets him in. Now the fish um, is is uh, uh, brought in to the emperor, and the emperor is is very upset because he's been woken from a nap. So the emperor chastised him for disturbing his rest, and then he had the guards beat the fisherman and scratch him with the mullet. All right, so beat him over the face and then scratch his face with the mullet. Now the fisherman was whimpering through bloodied lips, and he said, "I'm glad I didn't bring you the giant crab I caught." At that point, the emperor gleefully had the guards fetch the crab and beat him with that. <laughs> oh, good times. All right, another fun thing that Tiberius did at, uh, at Capri is he, had, he kept a gaggle of naked small boys that he called his minnows, and he would have these boys and girls dressed like sea nymphs and hide in the caves and grottos to be found by Tiberius, which was a little act that he called the haunts of Venus. Ugh. All right, he also kept a massive tome of of pornography in his bedroom as a, as reference materials all right and then finally he uh was you know he's just a nasty dude all in all and so finally he came to a sticky end in which um he was probably smothered by his chief helper while slowly dying all right and so uh, at that point the people of rome shouted into the tiber with tiberius all right they did not like him all right but guess what more fun things to come with a man named uh, Caligula. All right, now Caligula is going to rule from 37 to 41, not very long, just four years of terror. All right, thank God it was only four. All right, his favorite sayings were, uh, when he was with some friends at a banquet, he said, it has just occurred to me that I only have to give one nod and your throats will be cut. <laughs> All right, and then to guards of a row of criminals, he said, kill every man between that one and the bald head and that one over there too. All right, so that's just kind of fun. And then to his people, his favorite uh, saying was, Rome is a city of necks just waiting for me to chop. <laughs> uh, all right, so to anyone else that would listen, he would just say, I am a god. Mm -hmm. All right, so good guy. Yeah, Caligula. Um, weird dude. He had a lot of nasty habits, including practical jokes. For instance, there was a priest at a sacrificial ceremony in which he, the priest handed Caligula a hammer to hit the animal over the head and kill it. Well, Caligula took the hammer and then hit the priest over the head instead. He also murdered his cousin, he murdered his grandmother, murdered his father-in-law, slept with all three of his sisters, for goodness sakes, as well as a coterie of male and female prostitutes and other men's wives. He also had a senator torn from or torn apart and had his entrails dragged through the streets of Rome. He made his guards play war with him and killed them if they hesitated to strike him. All right, just weird. All right, the guy also enjoyed uh, going to the Colosseum and liked to have uh, or liked to watch humans be killed by animals for sport, like tigers and bears and you name it, any kind of fun things. So uh, he was upset though because it cost a lot of a lot of meat to feed the animals, and so so while waiting for the games to be held, he would feed the animals criminals. You know, it makes sense. I guess, if you're a dictator and you're a terrible tyrant. All right, his rottenness act, uh, we already heard about some of those nasty things right there, but another thing that made him kind of funny, his daftest act, as I say, was making Incitatus his consul. Incitatus was his horse. Mm-hmm, yeah. Imagine how the Senate felt about that one. Well, came to a sticky end because the guards uh, in the pro... pro yeah. The guards and the Praetorian guards uh, ended up killing him and his family in a palace rampage, a bloody palace rampage. Good times. All right, then we get Claudius. So Claudius will rule from 41 to 54 CE. All right, now uh, one of his favorite sayings was, execute him! He said it a lot, a lot in fact, uh, about all kinds of different people. His nastiest habit was watching criminals being tortured and men being executed by flogging to death. Now his rottenness act was the execution of party goers. You see, he discovered that his wife was a bit of a flirt, uh, a little bit of a 
saucy little minx, and so uh, she liked to have wild parties with her friends. Very wild, reportedly. And so, at one point, she was in the midst of one of these wild drinking escapades, uh, possibly also um, uh, amidst some orgiatic kinds of activities, and he had her executed along with 300 other people that were also at the party. So, lesson there, don't go to uh, Claudius's wife's parties, right? Not a good time in the end. All right, now, uh, he comes to a sticky end after he gets poisoned by his, ni- by his niece, Agrippina. Um, she poisoned him with mushrooms so that her young son could become the emperor. And that young son happened to be Nero. All right, so Nero is going to be an interesting character to say the least. Uh, For those of you that are missing class, uh, we're going to watch a little documentary on Nero and see through dramatic portrayal just how crazy this guy really was. All right, so uh, interesting character though. His favorite sayings, for instance, uh, one of them uh, was, I am a true artist. He loved to act. He also said, only the Greeks are worth my genius. And then, what a loss I shall be for art and music. Oh, all right, he's a strange dude. All right, his nastiest habit, uh, he liked going incognito. He would go to the streets and play his lyre for people and then criticize others who'd played and say that they were terrible and that they were ruinous to art itself. When they argued with him, he would have his Praetorian guards, who were also incognito, kill them, all right? So he also uh, uh, murders people a lot. He killed his half-brother by poisoning. His brother Britannicus uh, had a food taster, all right, or a food tester. And after testing the wine, he survived. So then Britannicus then drank some of the wine and said it was too warm, and so he asked for cold water. And then he died, because guess what? The cold water was poisoned. (laughs) All right, clever Nero. All right, he also had his first wife, Octavia, murdered and then had the head sent to his girlfriend, Pompeia. All right, he also enjoyed uh, doing lots of weird things where, all right, we heard about Britannicus uh, and Octavia. He also liked doing weird things to Christians. So he rounded up Christians. He would tie them to a post, cover them in tar, and then set them on fire. He covered them in animal skins and threw them to hungry wild dogs in the Colosseum. He crucified them in large numbers in the Colosseum as well uh, as animals were sent in to rip them to pieces. All right, he tried to have his own mother, Agrippina, killed as well. He uh, had her and her friends get on a ship with oarsmen with uh, a bunch of oarsmen, and this was his rottenness act, by the way, tried to have Agrippina get on a ship with a bunch of oarsmen, um, and so the ship was supposed to sink. There were weights hanging above Agrippina's head that were supposed to fall, kill her, then sink the ship and make it look like an accidental collision with a rock. Instead, the weights hit and killed her friend, and the ship didn't sink. Oarsmen uh, were, were supposed to be ready if this failed to kill Agrippina. So her friend, who was about to die, said, Help! I'm Agrippina! Save me! They killed her instead, while uh, Agrippina, the real one, jumped overboard and swam to safety. All right, so good times, yeah. And then uh, Nero also uh, had some assassins with clubs find her, and instead she offered her belly as she was facing off with these assassins, offered her belly so that they could kill her with a sword where her rotten son had been in her womb. He told everyone it was a suicide. Ooh. All right, now his second wife, Papia, uh, that one didn't uh, go very well uh, either because, you see, she is going to get pregnant, and we'll see what happens to her here in a second because uh, her death will come after the fire of Rome. All right, so with the fire of Rome, this is where things just get especially weird. I mean, before the fire of Rome, Nero, by all accounts, was actually a pretty decent ruler, you know, aside from all the other things we just went through, but he was a pretty decent ruler all in all. And after the fire of, uh, or during the fire of Rome, it was said that he was playing the lyre, playing music as the city was burning down to the ground. Now that may be just a legend that was said about him after the fact, because honestly, uh, there are many reports as well that have said that he in fact was out there with him, with himself working and his own men working to put out the flames by carrying buckets of water with the other volunteers around the city to uh, toss out the flames uh, as quickly as they could. So after the fire of Rome, Nero wanted to be able to rebuild the city. He wanted, like Augustus, to build it in marble and to build it as a 
a beautiful cultural center of the world, not just a political center of the Roman world, but also a cultural center that could uh, that could that could mimic the the Greeks and surpass the Greeks with their amphitheaters and and make uh, Rome the new place to go if you were an artist, because of course Nero thought himself quite the artist. Well, uh, he was met with great applause from the people who who saw his efforts, loved that he was giving them jobs, and I mean the senators didn't love it because it was costing all of the treasury. Every little cent, every little sesterce was being paid out to the people who were rebuilding this city. All right, and so that did not go real well because he starts kind of losing his mind here and the Senate is going to uh, start to love him less and less as time goes on and the people are going to start to think he's weirder and weirder. You see, at one point, he, uh, after they built some, some new theaters, he decided he wanted to act in a play. And so there was a tragedy contest in which he uh, colored him his face black and then acted as a Greek tragedian. All right. And so as he's performing this play, he actually biffed one of the lines. He, he ruined one of the lines, forgot what he was supposed to say, and then just kind of uh, nervously went on and, and hoped that he would uh, still be met with wide applause. Right. And so uh, if that were the case, he would have lost. All right. He certainly should have lost the competition and everybody knew it. But guess who won the competition? He did. Yeah, okay, because the people voted, and naturally he was the winner. Well, now when Pompeia was uh, was discussing the play afterward with him, she was saying, oh, that was so good, and it's okay that you blew your lines and that you messed it up. And he was like, wait, what did you just say to me? You just made fun of me for messing up my lines? How dare you? And at that point, Nero ended up kicking his wife to death. She was pregnant, by the way. Kicking his pregnant wife to death. Stomped on her face until it was crushed in and the baby inside smushed inside of her womb. All right, crazy. Dude. And then after that, things get even worse because at the public funeral, uh, the, the Romans, by the way, had this weird thing in which they would put the dead body of a uh, illustrious figure in, in front of of everyone on display for a few days, dressed up in all these clothes to make them look really pretty and like they're still alive. Kind of awkward, right? So she's sitting there in front of the Senate and he's explaining to them how he's not a murderer and how he loved her so much and how she died by her own hand and how that none of this is his fault. And then at that point, he's going to end up going to Greece and he's going to spend his time trying to be an artist, ruling uh, in absentia from Rome. And he's going to fall in love with a male slave. And the male slave is going to reportedly uh, take on, uh, I mean, they're going to swap between who gets to be the female in the relationship and who gets to be the male, but this male slave, I mean, it's uh, just awkward, okay, just awkward, in fact, because, um, He's busy bankrupting Rome at the moment as he's living in Greece. Meanwhile, there are these uh, these these governors of Gaul, Spain, and Africa, and Germania who are beginning to rebel and request the Senate's report. And so there will be a conspiracy that will bring down Nero because he uh, they're going to drive him out of Rome. And as he's running out of Rome, he's going to end up just killing himself, putting a knife in his own throat because he does not want to be tracked down by the Senate. So the fact is that Nero is just a crazy dude. A lot of weird things happening there. And so the questions to be asked here is what kind of lessons can we glean from the rule of the Julian Claudian emperors? All right, so was it better to have a republic? Was it better to have a flawed system or to have something that ha in which we have absolute par power, paranoia, and political violence all the time in Roman politics? I mean, is it really that different from the republic? Now we just have one man that's obviously crazy rather than multiple men who are competing for influence like Sulla or Caesar or uh, or Pompey. All right, so the question is, are we stronger now because of it? Well, Mark Twain says, the past does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. So we also see from the rule of the Julio-Claudians that, that uh, I mean, they're not just the only examples of when absolute power corrupts absolutely. All right, so some other things just to quickly wrap things up here. In the year 69, we see that the it's the year of the four emperors. At this point, Susan Wise Bauer tells us that in the past year, four rulers had claimed the power of princeps, and it was clear that the fiction of power awarded by the Senate on behalf of the people was total fraud. The power in Rome was held by the strongest man with the most armed support. So these four emperors are going to duke it out for a while, and then that's going to lead to, uh, uh, you know, it was a little civil war that finally will result in five good emperors. Finally, after all kinds of problems, uh, we're going to see uh, some actual good emperors coming in. All right, and those five good emperors are Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, 
Antonius Pius and Marcus Aurelius. We're not going to take the time to look heavily into their careers right now, but what we see is that now we're starting to have a system in which it's finally running stably, okay? So after nearly a century of difficulty after Augustus, uh, we've got five good emperors that are finally coming in to try and run the uh, empire fairly well, all right? There's going to be more after them that aren't going to be good emperors, but uh, we're going to set up a system of succession by adoption. It's obvious that that succession by adoption in which you choose the correct uh, leader is probably the best way to go. So we see in the rule of the five good emperors that it was in this period that the centralization of authority in the hands of the emperor was completed. We have what's called dual control, uh, which was established by Augustus, which had been unreal enough in the first century, but now, though not formally abolished, is systematically ignored in practice. All right, what that means is that the Senate before served as a dual ruler with the emperor, and now we just don't have that anymore, okay? So the Senate thus has ceased to be an instrument of government, and it's become an imperial per peerage, meaning that now it's largely composed of men who are not qualified by election. We don't have people voting for these men because they're actually good, all right? But rather, they are directly ennobled by the emperor himself. He gets to pick who joins him. So from this time period in which we see the Senate acting as imperial peerage, we see uh, a new term called constitutionis, which means that the decisions are made by the emperor without Senate approval. They just exist almost as advisors. They exist as amici, as they're called, friends or advisors of the emperor. But at this point, the, uh, the Republic could not seem further from Roman history.